Welcome back to Skyfire Live with your hosts, Matt and Ben. Today it's just us. What? So we're just going to dance for 30 minutes to this what? awesome music. Let me turn it up. <laughs> we got three, eight, three minutes and 18 seconds left on it. So, I mean, you did, just let me know if you want me to bring it back up. Did you say we have no one on with us today? It is just me and you, and that's it. How did that and happen? the audience? Uh, I blame somebody else. Cool. I blame Bruce. <laughs> I yeah, blame let's Bruce. blame Bruce. Yeah, he's Bruce, not here to defend himself. Man, Bruce can't believe it's all on you. Bro. Um, hey, notice I'm wearing a hat today. You know why? Uh, I I doubt. Did you get a haircut? No, the hair. Oh, actually, the hairs are make less sense. The hairs are too many. Um, baseball starts next week. Ah, I know that you're it terrib- does. I know that you're terribly excited about that. Wait, are you going to be able to see the Rockies games from your apartment? I'll be able to see if they hit certain foul balls or okay. home runs. Like, I won't be able to see them, but if they hit a home run, I'll be able to see it. So you realize you're going to be like one of like 14 people in the country that are actually going to get to watch baseball live. No, I know. I'm, I'm very excited. Um, they are. It, this is actually kind of interesting. The state, no, the, uh, the Colorado Rockies uh, are creating a proposal to the state and the city to actually have fans at games in a limited capacity later this year really yeah i don't know how far that'll go i imagine a lot of other teams are doing that but that's uh that's what they're aiming for yeah so we'll see well colorado is doing better than georgia where i live or florida where i am right now (laughs) so that's true that's true that doesn't take much but uh maybe that's doable so uh Interesting story. I am coming out to visit you in a couple of weeks and also my sister-in-law who had a baby and brother. What? Yeah, but get this. I'm going to have to shave my beard to wear the mask. Oh, that's right. Plain. So Corona beard, right. no more. Yep. All right. Well, as, as fascinated as everybody is about my <laughs> facial hair and your baseball tickets uh, or your baseball vantage point, uh, let's uh, let's take a couple of questions here because, yeah, so it's just us today. It actually is not Bruce's fault. Um, although it is fun to blame him for it. Um, But uh, no, we wanted to actually just get to a couple of different questions. So rather than do one topic with uh, with a guest, uh, we're just going to plow through some questions from customers and viewers and other interested parties. So uh, the uh, way to send in a question is to actually comment on the Facebook Live, and I am monitoring that. Uh, We already have one comment. Wait, where'd it go? I'll find it. Anyway, uh, we already have one comment and I look forward to seeing more. Oh, it's from Jake's mom. Hi, Lisa. What is upcoming this year for Skyfire? That is a great one and we will answer it shortly. Uh, So the first question that I want to get to, because it's uh, probably the least visually interesting. Um, Ben, it's COA related. So this is all you. Uh, The question we get a lot from our clients, how do I file the monthly CAPS report? And what does that mean even, and what is that, what needs to be in it? Well, uh, you know what I would, under normal circumstances, I would do a screen share and share the screen and share the CAP system with you. Um, but I'm unable to access, access CAPs at the moment. So, um, which is something that, uh, you, you know, CAPS is, is, and I think admittedly so from the FA is not the best system that they have in place yeah. for doing these COAs and um, and, and can be frustrating to work with. And I, there's a lot of a, that out there. And I think one of the things that, that we've done pretty well is kind of help people through that um, and, and kind of work, figure out where all the bugs and the kinks are and kind of be able to work around with that stuff. So um, as far as you are, if you have a COA, you are required to file a monthly report. And anyone that wants to know how to do this specifically, feel free to call me or email me and I can actually walk you through it over the phone. It's actually really simple. Um, you log into CAPS and on the main CAPS page, there is uh, a, t- or a link for submit reports and you click on that. And then you select your COA and select monthly report. Uh, it walks you through, it's really simple. And then it takes you to this page and it asks you to input uh, where your flights were, how many flights you did, uh, if you had any anomalies or incidents or accidents, those kinds of things. And so you just input it in there and then hit submit. It is a requirement. It's even a requirement if you don't fly. Uh, during that month. So um, there's no requirement on what day of the month it has to be done. You can do yours on the 1st or the 30th or the 15th or whatever you want to do for the previous month. Um, but uh, but it the is a 12th. 
Yes, you could do any day of the month. You could <laughs> what if um, the month doesn't have a 30th? <laughs> Sorry, continue. Uh, no, those are good. Those are great questions, Matt. Thanks for, yeah. thanks for adding yeah, no to problem. the discussion here. <laughs> you got it. That's what I'm here for. Um, but uh, but yeah, so you just, that that's how you do it. Like I said, it's there's a, a menu option on the main page in CAPS when you log in, um, once you're able to log in. And uh, and then you just kind of follow the prompts and select your COA and uh, and just go through that. And there's, you know, that I don't, I don't know how many people are out there doing that. Um, definitely uh, should be doing that. Uh, that is a requirement in the COA. Uh, I'm not sure where that data goes to right now, uh, but um, uh, that is something you should be doing if you have a COA. Uh, Follow-up question to that. When you say where your flights were, how specific do they want you to be? Like, do they want latitude, longitude? Do they want address? Yeah, like, you know, general? that's a great question. I haven't looked at it in a little, little while. I think it's lat long that they want in there. And a lot of the, like a lot of the uh, recording stuff, like DJI software and all that, that'll actually give all that information if you log it through their app or something like DroneSense, one of those apps will we'll do that for you so that you can put that in there. Awesome. All right, cool. Um, so Real while quick, we are on, yeah, Matt, I'm sorry. I just kind of, while we're talking about like COAs and stuff right now, I actually think um, it might be a good time just for, to spend a minute on um, uh, TFRs. Can you oh, yeah. actually um, give me uh, the host so I can share my screen? Well, maybe I yeah. can do that. Uh, make host. Uh, there you go. All yours. Ah, I'm the host. Really, ex really exciting. <laughs> You've really reached a milestone, Ben. <laughs> Come so far. Uh, okay, so I'm going to share my screen now, and let's find the right one here. Hang on. You think I'd have this down now with all these trainings I've been doing, but uh, sorry, guys. I don't know what is going on with this. Hang on one second. So what I'm trying to pull up here is um, the president is uh, coming to Atlanta today. Is so I heard. And um, all right, here we go. Now I got it. You guys, do you see that, Matt? You guys have that? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. It. So the, I've just got Sky Vector pulled up here. Uh, this is the Atlanta sectional for those that have um, had to suffer through uh, my airspace classes. Uh, you know what this is. And this is the Class B airspace surrounding Atlanta. And one of the things that we talk about in our classes, uh, especially since uh, the students will be flying drones inside the national airspace system, is that uh, TFRs, what we call temporary flight restrictions, apply to drone operations. And so TFRs happen for a variety of reasons, everything from wildfires to what they call VIP movement, or in this case, um, uh, the president. And so one of the things that we see a lot, we've seen a lot uh, in general aviation over the years where uh, people don't actually check TFRs and they end up flying into one. And then uh, the Air Force scrambles fighter jets and Blackhawks and escorts this airplane down. Well, again, you know, this applies to drones as well. So uh, you always want to be any day that you're flying before the flight, you always want to check for TFRs because this one came up uh, what I thought was last minute. I didn't even know about this until an hour ago when I saw it um, kind of come across the feed. So for example, if I were a police department or a fire department within a 30 nautical mile radius of the city of Atlanta, or I should say the, um, uh, the airport for Atlanta, Hartsfield, then on a day like today when the president's coming, and I'm going to add this layer on here, which will show the TFR, and that's how I do that, and there it is. So you can see there's this giant, um, see these red rings, and based on where you are in this kind of 10 mile ring, that's a lot more strict than in this 30 mile ring. But basically inside of this 30 nautical mile ring from I think it's 2.15 to 6.15 local uh, Eastern time in Atlanta, you can't fly a drone here unless you have very special permission. And so, uh, the, you know, and this is something obviously for a presidential TFR, this is huge, right? This is a 30 mile area. And so that covers there's a lot of people that don't even know this, um, but especially if you're, you know, an agency, it's something you want to be aware of because technically you you would not be able to fly your mission today unless you called uh, the um, systems operations support center and they gave you uh, uh, essentially kind of emergency access to do it. and that's something you would coordinate with them depending on the emergency depending on where it was they may or may not authorize that authorize that drone flight so um, so you can find these on uh, you can find the text for this on um, uh, sky vector here which then will take you to the uh, all the wording for the the NOTAM or the TFR in here, and so that then down at the very bottom it says, um, here's the phone number you can contact uh, to get a hold of somebody to ask for permission. 
And it does specifically say that the following operations are not authorized within this TFR. It's uh, flight training, uh, aerobatic flight glider, seaplane, parachute, ultralight, hang gliding, balloon, uh, crop dusting, animal population control flight operations, banner towing, sightseeing, maintenance, model aircraft operations, model rocketry, unmanned aircraft systems, and utility and pipeline survey operations. That's pretty much everything except for uh, uh, airlines, right? So uh, I just wanted to, you know, I saw that come up uh, today. I know there are a lot of people that don't really pay a lot of attention to this, but this is something that we want to emphasize and let you know, like, hey, it doesn't come up a lot, but when it does, it's a big deal. And if you violate one of these, um, whether you're a drone or you're an airplane or for whatever purpose you're doing it, it, it can be um, can cause, you cause some grief. Scroll back down a little bit on that screen. Yeah. Then? Yeah. So it actually tells you what happens if you violate it. Uh, oh, number, yeah, there you go. Letter D there. Yeah. Uh, the DOJ or uh, may take security action that results in interference, disruption, seizure, seizure, damaging, or destruction of unmanned aircraft deemed to pose a credible safety or security threat to protected personnel, facilities, or assets. So what that means is the Department of Justice actually has the statutory authority to be able to take your drone out of the air. They're one of the only agencies that has that ability, but uh, certainly when the president's traveling, they will not hesitate to use it. And we, you remember, we, we dealt with that in the Super Bowl. Um, yeah or the two Super Bowls ago, I guess. Um, and, you know, the the FBI, I think, made a bit, you know, they went on TV and showed all, how many, you know, dozens of drones did they confiscate? 50, yeah, 57. Um, yeah, right. Uh, and those people do not have their drones back and probably That's never right. will. So, um, so it's very important. Uh, like I said, not common, but is something that you want to take a look at. And um, the other thing I just want to mention here real quick, and and I know we're kind of in the weeds a little bit here, but it kind of goes no, along this, with this. That's what this whole thing is about. We're getting in the weeds. <laughs> cool. Um, the, if I, so this is, um, this website here that I've got pulled up is 1-800-WX-BRIEF. It's called 1-800-WX-BRIEF because uh, before uh, we were really using the internet for this stuff, we were actually calling 1-800-WX-BRIEF and we would talk to a flight briefer uh, for manned aircraft flights. And that flight briefer would give us information like NOTAMs and TFRs that we were just looking at and, adverse conditions on our route of flight. Uh, but this, this website kind of serves uh, two purposes for, um, especially for our users out there, right? Our, our clients. And, and the first one is just um, uh, flight planning in general. And you, if you have an account in here to, to get a briefing to, um, once you have an account, you have to, uh, or you can use that account to file uh, the required notams for your COA. So, uh, so two things there. So you can get the full weather briefing, you can find out about TFRs, and your information is recorded here. So if the FAA came back and said, well, you didn't do enough pre-flight planning for your flight, didn't know about that TFR, you can come in here and say, hey, actually, I wasn't even informed about this TFR and here's my actual flight briefing and here, here it is saved in here in the system. So, so just another tool for you, um, a way to file uh, NOTAMs for your COA and get up-to-date information uh, to make sure that you're not violating any TFRs or any other NOTAMs that are going on out there. So that's awesome. all I got on that. Um, and, and also the DJI uh, software, a lot of times the NOTAMs and TF or the TFRs at least um, of this size will pop up, but sometimes they don't. And that might be for various reasons, whether it means your software is not updated or you don't have an internet connection or something. Um, so that is a possibility as well too. So don't just rely on that um, for getting your great TFR point. information. Yeah, yeah, great point. Cause you could easily miss it for sure. So while we're on the topic of COAs, um, one of the questions we got recently was about adding new drones to your COA. So you go through the process, you get your COA, you're up and running, then you buy a couple of new drones, you get a grant or something. How does that process work? Uh, you froze on me there for a second, Matt. Can you talk? There you are, sorry, I missed that. Can you <laughs> say it again? Sorry about that. Uh, the question was, uh, you get your COA and then you go out and get a grant or something and you wanna add some new drones. How do you actually add a, a COA to your drone? Uh, drone oh, to your uh, yeah, no, great question. We get this a lot. This is actually another one of those that, that the FAA is very clear on the way that they want you to do this. And uh, we're certainly seeing that people are not complying with this um, in the way that they're supposed to. So um, essentially when you, and if you may, if you filed a COA or you had us do it or you had someone else do it, um, you filled out a form uh, on your agency letterhead that we call an airworthiness declaration. In a sense, essentially, the, the agency is attesting to the airworthiness of the aircraft that you're using. And so the, the way that this comes up a lot of times is someone, they, they go out, an agency goes out, and they get an aircraft, and let's say they get a Phantom. Um, 
and they're flying there, they get a Mavic 2 and they're flying this uh, Mavic 2. They do the um, airworthiness statement that basically says we're going to adhere to manufacturer recommendations, all of that. And um, they, you have to carry that with you. So anyone that's operating the drone has to be able to have access to that. That could be digital or a paper copy or whatever. What happens then, the agency's like, cool, now let's say they got all this grant money and they go out, they buy a new, um, you know, Matrice 210 and a Matrice 300 and a couple Mavic Minis for training and they get all these new aircraft. You're actually supposed to create a new airworthiness uh, certificate for each aircraft. Now you don't, today, the way that the COAs are worded, you don't have to actually go and apply. And you used to have to like put that back to um, the FAA. Uh, or apply for that aircraft to be on the COA, uh, that's no longer the case. So because the COAs now say that it's aircraft under 55 pounds. However, you still have to do that airworthiness certificate for every aircraft you have. You can do all of them on one certificate um, or you can have them all on separate certificate, certificates. It doesn't really matter. It's just whoever's flying has to have access to that. And then once you create that certificate, then essentially your aircraft is now added to your COA or added to your um, uh program essentially and uh, so anytime you bring in a new aircraft just make sure you do that if you need the wording on it or the um, uh, verbiage for that or how to do that we have a template I can send that to you or um, kind of show you how to do that good deal uh, well thank you very much for that one while we're on the topic of COAs uh, how can a volunteer a fire department get a COA through the city or county and is that a uh, yeah yeah, it's a huge issue. It's a huge issue um, because a volunteer agency is technically not considered a political subdivision of a state. Um, and it's, it's difficult to prove that and the way that that's structured, typically they're not, which means they technically don't qualify for public aircraft operations. So, so the process for that is hard. The FAA will pretty much say, you know, it's, it's not necessarily a road you really want to go down unless you are prepared for um, a lot of paperwork and a lot of back and forth with FAA legal. And in addition, you basically have to find uh, an agency that will um, uh, support you or kind of file on your behalf and get the COA and essentially allow you to, to work off that. There's, there's an advisory circular out there that talks about public aircraft operations and gets very, very in-depth into this kind of stuff and specifically how to do it and the processes involved. Um, it is difficult for a volunteer agency to get one. Not impossible, but it is difficult. And um, we can certainly advise on that. We have this uh, advisory cir circular we can send to you and all that, so. Okay, awesome. Well, this is becoming the uh, Ask Ben Coa questions webinar. So <laughs> that's good because we get a lot of them. So um, very cool. Uh, ben, you wanted uh, one of the ones that you brought to the table, you're talking about the, um, AIRT and Drone Responders uh, Public Safety Survey um, that was just released the other day. Some really interesting results came up on that. Um, do you wanna walk us through that? Yeah, let me, uh, let me pull that back up. Yeah, some, some yeah, really um, focused, um, I think a, a, a well done survey from, um, from Drone Responders and AIRT. Um, and, some of the data that came out of it, they were, you know, they really went to, to public safety and asked what they were using it for and funding and those kinds of things. Um, just some, a couple quick numbers that jumped out at me. Um, it says uh, 60, just and these are some, just some notes kind of off of this. Some 60% of public safety agencies are operating on less than 10,000 per year. Um, and 23% are operating a drone program on less than $1,000, which is, wow. Uh, so, so people are not spending a lot uh, but hopefully getting a, a good return on that. Um, 60 or unfortunately, started, people are putting their own money in. Like, yeah, that's like, true. Uh, yeah. Firefighters yeah. and stuff are buying their own stuff. Yeah, which is that's great. That's right. Yep. 60% um, said that grant programs uh, were extremely important uh, to their drone programs. And uh, let's see what else I had on here. Uh, obviously, you know, so more than 75% of responders say that uh, BV loss flight, beyond visual line of sight, would be useful for their operations. Um, and, uh, let's see. Yeah. So there was, I mean, if, and, and we'll, we'll post this, Matt, we should post this, a link to this. Um, yeah. it, it's pr pretty interesting stuff about, um, kind of what folks are using it for and kind of what percentage is using a, a COA versus, you know, part 107 and some of the reasons for that. So, um, yeah, let's, let's post that. And people can kind of, yeah, I will. That. 
I will put that in the comments right now on Facebook. Um, yeah, no, this is great stuff. So um, awesome, awesome stuff from our buddies over at Drone Responders and AirT. So I just posted that link there to the article. Um, and okay, we have a question here from our buddy, Mike Bryant from Skydis. Uh, he talks to a lot of law enforcement agencies about starting programs. Um, so do we recommend a COA or a Part 107 certification? This is a big can of worms here. And so we will give you uh, we'll give you our opinion, but it's actually sort of evolved over the years, I think, um, just kind of going with the uh, with what, what's out there. So, Ben, you want to take this one, too? Yeah. So and and uh, you kind of cut there for a second. He's asking what is which one which one is better? Is that essentially it's co or one seven? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is this gets down to <laughs> uh, arguments, uh, ways of thinking, um, uh, different uh, opinions, different. Uh, guidance and, and changing guidance from F, from the FAA over the years. I think that if you talk to the FAA right now, they're and especially the folks in the kind of the public safety arena at the FAA, they they probably recommend both. Um, and there's there's a couple reasons for that. One, when the COA gives you a little bit more latitude um, for operations, included in a COA is night operations. Um, it includes a, a caveat where you can fly uh, over people in situations where it's safe necessary to safeguard human life, which you cannot do. Uh, under part 107. Uh, so already, you know, it kind of gives you a little bit more uh, latitude, um, but it, it puts more responsibility on the agency. You know, we talk about this a lot because the agency then has to self-certify their training and their aircraft and their maintenance and recurrency and all that kind of stuff. So, so it really depends on a host of factors. It depends on the airspace. It depends on what you're going to be using the drone for. If you're an agency that's like, oh, we just want to use the drone for like some community outreach we want to like take some pictures of the parade and some of our uh officers at work and those kinds of things then um that would you can only do that under part 107 that you don't need a governmental function uh to fly as a public aircraft operator using a coa uh, under those types of missions so uh the flip side of that is if you're a fire department and you're using it on fires to kind of help locate, you know, where you need to put water and, and the hose and the spray and all that, then that absolutely is a governmental function. And so that would follow, qualify as a co mission. So, um, so that's why, you know, it's, I wish there was like a real simple answer to that question. And that's probably as simple uh, as we can break it down because there's, there's a lot of nuance to it. There's a lot of having to kind of understand uh, where your agency exists in the airspace and, um, and kind of what rules apply to you there. So we, we try to make that easy for folks and uh, we can, anyone out there who is uh, wondering that themselves um, or it, you know, if they're an agency, we'll help you walk, we'll help walk you through that, right? Like you can just call us and we'll take a look and go, well, here's what we think, you know, here's our opinion. And, and that's having said done, you know, hundreds of COA, uh, a ton of one of seven stuff and waivers, you know, and we've been all over the country, you know, doing this stuff for five years. And so we can really kind of quickly um, give you the pros and cons uh, for the COA or the 107 uh, just by looking real quick at your agency. Yeah, so it depends on what you're trying to do and where you're trying to do it. And there are definitely some people where 107 might be enough. Um, so yeah. yeah, we can help you kind of walk through that. So um, very cool. The one thing, one comment that I will add uh, on the um, part 107 front is that if you are gonna go the part 107 route, um, just getting your part 107 certificate can't be all that you do because it doesn't actually teach you anything about flying a drone. It just teaches you how to read maps and weather and all those kinds of things, but you actually want to make sure that you're still getting really good training. So that's my little, my little soapbox on 107. Uh, let's see if we have any other questions here. Uh, well, let's get to, uh, Lisa's question. What's upcoming this year for Skyfire? Um, a lot of really great stuff coming up this year. Um, a lot of it we can't talk about <laughs> yet. Um, but uh, but I will say, you know, it's been a real struggle for us um, to to be in front of, to not be in front of you guys um, at trade shows and stuff like that because we have so much fun interacting with people and showing off the cool new stuff. Um, I will say that uh, we're going to have our colleague Walt on here pretty soon to talk about some of the new aircraft that Viking is gonna be releasing. Um, some of the stuff, the stuff that you might expect, some of it is stuff that you definitely won't expect, uh, but that we're super excited about. Um, so I think that's a big part of what we're, what we're gonna be doing going forward. 
um, doing a lot more um, stuff together with Mike Bryant and the folks over at Skydis um, on the law enforcement, counterterrorism, um, you know, tactical application front uh, and the training and stuff. Um, great, we've been out doing, uh, you've been out specifically, been doing a lot more hands-on training. So that's really exciting that we're back to doing some of that. So um, those are some of the things that are coming. I, unfortunately, that's about as specific as I can get at this point, but uh, suffice it to say that uh, if you ask Jake, he'll tell you more <laughs> and not on Facebook. Yeah. yeah, and I think, I mean, I think that like we're, we're in a mode of um, continuing to kind of bring what we brought like the past five years, like in all that, like, like we, we really have strived to bring, um, you know, the best customer service um, to our clients. And so in kind of all of this stuff that Matt's talking about, uh, we're going to kind of continue to do that. So I'm excited uh, for this year. I know it's kind of been thrown on its head, obviously not just us. I mean, that's, you know, obviously the whole world, um, but we're, um, uh, we're, you know, we're trying to work through it, get through it and uh, continue to bring um, that quality service to um, all of our customers and expand that and be able to kind of help do, do more good out there uh, within public safety. Yep, well said. Um, the last thing that I want to talk about, unless any other questions come in, um, is our giveaway. So for anybody who didn't watch uh, two weeks ago or hasn't seen our website or Propellerhead's email, um, we are giving away a drone program. So you can go over to our super cool and exciting new website at skyfireconsulting.com and you'll find out all the details. But we are giving away a uh, blanket COA, uh, some hands-on training, and 107 training, uh, Mavic 2 Enterprise Dual, thanks to our friends at WS Darling Company, um, and lots of other exciting stuff coming up, some other giveaways and things like that. So definitely go to our website and check that stuff out. Make sure you sign up, and we will be uh, giving away the program, or we'll be announcing the winner, I should say, uh, on the 22nd. So uh, coming up here, I guess, on next week's um, Facebook Live, we'll be doing it. So that's very exciting to look forward to. So wish you guys all luck. Uh, on that front. And nice thing is uh, you got a pretty good chance of winning. I mean, we definitely have a couple hundred entries, but uh, that's better than most contests that you sign up for. So some very exciting stuff there. Um, well, if there are not any other questions, Ben, did you have anything else that you wanted to chat about before we let everyone go? I don't think so. I think uh, I think they probably had enough of us. I'm, I'm sure everybody's waiting for our dance, our sweet dance moves. Is that really a thing? Is there really such a thing as enough of us? <laughs> yeah <laughs> i don't know i don't know all right well on that note i'll put up our music so we can we've got our super sweet dance moves coming through coming at you live from the skyfire facebook webinar <laughs> always wanted to be a radio dj so there you go oh, uh, I, yeah exactly so uh if you guys want more information on anything we're doing here at skyfire you can go to our website at skyfireconsulting.com you can find us on Facebook. You can find us on Twitter, Instagram. Uh, definitely not TikTok. We're still waiting on Brenda to help us with that one. We are not. We are way too old for that. Thing. I hate to tell you, but it is true. Thank you guys so much for watching. Keep up the great work uh, that you guys are doing out there to help protect us all. And we will see you next week.